Hello, everyone. This is Professor Elix uh, with Chapter 2. No, not Chapter 2, but Chapter 3 class for U.S. Government, PS 1113. Today, we will be talking about uh, the type of government that we have. And in the United States, the type of government we have is a republic. It's a constitutional republic. Some may characterize it as a democratic republic, and some maybe as a democracy, but at its core, uh, the United States has a constitutional republic. Now, our actual system of government is a federalist system. Now, what that means is that our system has levels of sovereignty. Again, like I explained in chapter two, the word sovereignty means it's a government body that has control over a specific geographical re region. So to use the example like I used in chapter two, uh, Oklahoma is a specific geographic region. It has sovereignty. It is controlled by the state legislator, the governor, which is the executive branch of the state, and the judicial arm is the Oklahoma State Supreme Court. Any laws that are created in the state of Oklahoma is for the state of Oklahoma. Any adjudication that goes through its court system is for the state of Oklahoma. Any president will be set for the state of Oklahoma. Any decisions that the governor makes will be for the state of Oklahoma. That is sovereignty. However, the federal government has sovereignty over the United States. Under the constitution, the federal government is the superior law of the land, thanks to the supremacy clause. And thanks to different uh, court cases that has been uh, adjudicated over time. And we will review some of those here in this, in this uh, lecture today. But right now, we're gonna go to the PowerPoint and chances are, I'm probably gonna go faster than the PowerPoint, but we're gonna hit the main point of it so that you can get, uh, you can understand what's going on with it. So let's start. Now, hopefully you can see this screen that I brought up. And we're gonna start with the first slide. Of course, the first slide, chapter three, which is uh, the lecture today, the federal system. Our learning objectives here are to trace the roots of the federal system and distinguish it from other types of government. This really does not go through it anyway. And also the United States is the first federal system. Explain the constitutional foundations for federalism. Trace the evolution of federalism from ratification to the present and analyze the impact of federalism on the relationships among national, state, and local levels of government. Now, the types of government that are available out in the world today are here as follows. There are monarchies, which are ruled by kings. So the individual human beings that are kings or queens or royal family are considered the sovereign, not necessarily the nation government itself, but individuals. Totalitarianism or authoritarianism is basically a government that is totally controlled by the central government, no matter what. So you may have a government like China, which actually has a federalist system, but they are totalitarian. That means they truly want to control every aspect of government. Oligarchy. Oligarchy is simply a system in which a few people control the country. This describes Russia in a way. Even though Russia has a basic system of democracy available and somewhat a federalist system as well. But the overall type of government is a, 
is an oligarchy. Of course, everybody knows who Putin is, but there are others, small group of people that control that country. Democracy, democracy or a pure democracy is truly controlled by the people. Everyday government decisions are done by the vote of the people. Republic it. We are a republic. We vote for people who we want to control the government, run the government, and they represent us in the government and make the decisions for us. We make the decisions uh, whether if they are doing the job of the people or not. Confederation. Confederation, like the Articles of Confederation, is a group of states bound together under an agreement to work together as one. The largest confederation that's in existence today is the European Union. That is confederation. It's a, it's a group of independent states working together under one body in order to maintain uh, in order to maintain a, a, a government. So each independent nation is still sovereign on their own, but they're all together. Now, the different types of systems, I mean, uh, different, we had uh, different types of government, but now we have types of systems here. Right here in this figure, you see the types of system. You have the federal system, national government and states derive authority from the people, but also the national government and state government and local government has specific sovereignty of their own. A unitarian system similar to Britain means one central government. It may sound more like totalitarian or, uh, or authoritarian government, but like the uh, British system, it's a parliamentary government, but the type of system that it runs is that the capital of England or UK is in London. Everything throughout UK is run from London. It's not like in the United States where you have Washington that is control over the whole country. And in our federal system, you have Oklahoma control over Oklahoma Texas control of Texas. The central government controls all. Confederate system, national government derives authority from states. Basically, uh, the European Union is a confederation. Let's see here. Now, federalism is dividing power under the Constitution. There are several powers that the Constitution grants uh, under federalism. Right now, there are national powers that are specifically are controlled by the federal government. These are expressed or enumerated powers that are controlled by the federal government. There are state powers that are just the states have. There are concurrent powers that the state and federal government both have and sometimes work together. There are powers that are denied under the Constitution for state and local government. And there's interstate regulations and local governments under the Constitution. Actually, local governments are under the Constitution, but it really isn't mentioned. Interstate uh, relations under the Constitution is more like the full faith and credit clause. So if one state or you go into contract with someone in one state, it has to apply in another. Now, enumerated powers, these are simply powers that are specifically listed in the Constitution to coin money, to conduct foreign relations, provide army and navy to declare war, collect duty and taxes. That, those are enumerated or specific powers listed in the Constitution for the national government. The Necessary and Proper Clause gives the right of Congress to enact laws what is necessary and proper to run the country. Implied powers are those powers that are implied by the Constitution 
for the national government to run the country. So like one of the powers that I, I brought up in chapter two as an example is telecommunications uh, regulation. It's an applied power because it is not listed in the constitution because telecommunications did not exist. However, under the supremacy clause, under the commerce clause of the constitution, since telecommunications runs from one state to another or interstate, it is implied by the constitution to regulate telecommunications. The supremacy clause simply states in the constitution that the constitution and the federal government is the supreme law of the land. State powers are not specifically enumerated. That means they're not specifically listed. State powers are left up to the states by the 10th Amendment, which simply says what is not expressed or forbidden or reserved for the federal government will be reserved for the states and individuals. So the 10th Amendment gives states their power to regulate themselves. Overlapping powers, which are considered concurrent powers, basically to tax, to borrow money, to establish courts, to charter banks, and to spend money for general welfare. Basically, a concurrent power is any power that the federal government can do and the states can do. So both are have the power to tax. Both have the power to borrow money. Both have the power to establish courts. Both have the power to charter banks. And both have power to spend money for the general welfare of their citizens. Now, interstate relations under the Constitution. The Supreme Court under the US Constitution specifically says in there that any disputes between states will be settled by the Supreme Court. The full faith and credit clause simply states that if any dispute between states that the Supreme Court will take care of it. Privileges and immunities clause means that if you are a citizen of the United States, all privileges under the Constitution and all immunities under the Constitution will apply to you. The extradition clause under the Constitution simply states that if you commit a crime in one state, you will be brought up for and adjudicate it and decide to turn you over to another state. And interstate compacts simply are just groups of states that come together to work together for economic or political reasons. Local government under the Constitution. There is no power under the Constitution that specifically states anything about local government. However, it says under the 10th Amendment, this is a reserve power for state government. So under the Dillon Rule of 1868, it gave states the right to charter individual communities and counties. So states, because of the Dillon Rule, go ahead and charter counties and municipalities. Forget municipalities, yeah, I can't pronounce it properly local towns and cities, and some special districts, some special economic or trading districts. Now, how many governments exist in the United States? This chart is actually very beautiful, and that's what I love about it. There is one US federal government, 50 state governments, and there are 90,000 local governments, and it includes over 3,000 counties, 19,000 cities, 16,000 townships, 12,000 school districts, and 38,000 special districts that government has established in this country. And that does not list, get this, 
it does not list your home. Because whether you believe it or not, each individual, according to the 10th Amendment, anything that has not been reserved for the federal government or prohibited is reserved to the states and individuals. So any law that the federal government or the constitution doesn't cover, any law that the state government doesn't cover, any law that any law that the local government or county government doesn't cover or private governments such as homeowners association or school, school boards, you in your own home govern under those laws. So if you don't want someone in your home that has come over without your permission, you can kick them out. If someone has illegally invaded your home, anything under the laws of the federal, state, and local governments, you can dispose of them however you wish. It is up to you. The evolution of federalism. Federalism under the Marshall Court was paramount. Um, let me give you an idea. Under Justice Marshall, when he came into the court in uh, 1801, our court decisions weren't very stable. And we didn't have consistency of justices on the Supreme Court and no one wanted the job of being uh, chief justice of the Supreme Court. But when Justice Marshall came to the US Supreme Court, he was in this position for almost 30 years. And he presided over some of the greatest decisions that established the authority of the federal government over state government. The first major case was McCullough versus Maryland in 1819. This was the first court decision that defined national and state government relationship. What happened in this case is that McCullough was in charge of the Bank of the United States and he wanted to open a branch in Baltimore, Maryland. Well, the state of Maryland felt like they could tax any bank that is chartered in their state. And under the laws of Maryland, they could. So at that time, the state of Maryland tried to charge the Bank of the United States tax McCullen filed in state court that it was incorrect and improper. It went to the state appellate court and Supreme Court and they upheld the decision to go ahead and tax the Bank of the United States. McCullen, of course, appealed to the US Supreme Court and under the Marshall Court, the decision came down as follows, that no state has authority over the United States through to, due to the supremacy clause of the constitution. Basically saying that no state can ever tax any property of the United States government or any of its entities. And the federal government cannot do the same. In Givens versus Ogden, Congress authority under the Con commerce clause was disputed. Basically, Gibbons and Ogden, it was, it was kind of a tug of war between the state of New York and, and a monopoly. I mean, state of New York and two companies that worked in different states. And what the state of New York wanted to do is take over uh, the ability of a certain company to regulate or to regulate uh, all trade and commerce on the Erie Canal from New York into Ohio. And of course, Givens, 
filed suit against Ogden, who at the time was governor of the state of New York, and under the Marshall Court in 1824, came back with the decision that Congress has the authority under the Commerce Clause to regulate interstate trade, not a state. A state can do it within its own state, but it cannot re regulate trade between two states. Only the federal government has that authority under the Commerce Clause and under the Supremacy Clause. This establishes the supremacy of the United States government, central government, and also establish the authority under the Commerce Clause of the United States government to regulate trade between states. Barron versus Baltimore, which is very, very important. It set up the first example of this dual federalist system that existed at this time. Under Barron v. Baltimore, this was a due process case in which Barron sued Baltimore because the state of, uh, because the city of Baltimore wanted to, uh, wanted to uh, regulate his business on the docks. And they took over and charged him for his business there without any due process. Barron objected, says the Fifth Amendment guaranteed my right to do this. The city of Baltimore says, no, it does not. Well, it went to the Supreme Court. And in this decision on under uh, Barron v. Baltimore, the Marshall Court ruled that anything that occurs in the federal jurisdiction is covered by the Fifth Amendment. Anything that is covered by the state jurisdiction is not covered by the Fifth Amendment. So essentially, anything that the federal government actually has power over, interstate commerce, rights between the state, uh, any disagreements between the states is a federal jurisdiction and is covered by the Bill of Rights. Anything that is done within the state that is not in federal jurisdiction is covered by state law. This set the precedent that states can do what they are and not covered by the 10th by, by uh, the civil liberties that are established in the Bill of Rights. And it set the president that everyone who does anything in federal territory is covered and protected by the Bill of Rights. Now, you probably think that's weird. Aren't we all protected by the Bill of Rights? We all are now. But as you will see as we go along, you'll see how that changes. Nullifications, when states declare federal laws null and void. The first state to do this was South Carolina in 1932, when the federal government uh, enacted a tariff law, which the state of South Carolina disagreed. State of South Carolina disagreed with it, said the, said the law is nullified, and we are going to secede from the United States because we totally disagree with it. At the time, Andrew Jackson was president of the United States, and he told the state of South Carolina, go ahead and try to succeed from the Union. I'll have 32,000 troops down there to make sure that you don't. And the state of South Carolina relented. Also, under the Dred Scott decision, let me tell you, under the Dred Scott decision, this decision took 10 years for the court to decide. It was, it reached the Supreme Court in 1847, but the decision for Dred Scott didn't come out until 1857. In the Dred Scott decision, you had a slave named Dred Scott who was moved from a slave state to a free state by his master and his master, 
passed away. Dred Scott, after the passing of his master, lived in a free state and declared himself free. However, the master left Dred Scott, which remember, people were property at this time, to his relatives in a slave state. Dred Scott filed a petition that says, I am a free person in a free state and that master had passed away, so I am no longer a slave. After 10 years of consideration, the Dred Scott decision did a couple of things. It declared that Dred Scott did not have standing in the Supreme Court because people who are black or slaves weren't citizens of the United States. There was no constitutional provision or law available. So he did not have standing to even bring this uh, case before the court. Number two, Congress could not ban slavery in any territories, which nullify the 1850 Compromise, which established what is called popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty said that any state that was entering the Union by popular vote could ban or allow slavery. And under this, under this decision, it also told that states' rights had every right to overlook several federal laws that were, that were uh, considered unpopular uh, by individual states. This decision alone, which a lot of people have said was an incorrect decision. It was incorrect when it referred to the Compromise of 1850 and overturn popular sovereignty because popular sovereignty was not even part of the case. It wasn't even joined to this case. It was just the court overstepping. But as when it came to Dred Scott himself, well, in the Constitution, enslaved people were considered three-fifths of a person. And that three-fifths of a person under the Constitution, under laws of different states, wasn't considered a person at all. So unfortunately, when it comes to Dred Scott himself, the decision was correct, which to this day burns me to my core to even say that. But at the time, the decision was correct. But under the Civil War, when the Civil War came, nullification due to federalism was totally thrown out the window. During Reconstruction phase after the Civil War, new state constitutions came into power. Supreme Court limited state power and monopolies were kind of outlawed and the 16th and 17th Amendment was in place. Now, this all happened under the dual federalist system. Now, let's explain this. Under, after the Civil War was fought, the 13th Amendment came into play that freed the slaves. The 14th Amendment came into, into play that not only made slaves citizens, but any person born within the United States, a citizen, of the United States. So natural born citizenry actually became official at this time. Number three, the 14th Amendment applied. And even though it wasn't interpreted at this time, it applied the protections of the Bill of Rights into the state constitution. At the time, it was seen that only those protections were for black people, not for everyone else. But later court decisions through what is through a process called selective incorporation eventually applied all 10 amendments 
of the Bill of Rights to states. Eventually, the 16th and the 17th Amendments came into play. The 16th Amendment allowed, uh, allowed uh, state taxation, I mean, uh, income taxation. I believe that was this, actually the 17th Amendment that did that. And the 16th Amendment gave individuals right to elect senators. Cooperative federalism. Cooperative federalism happened during the time when Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president. One of the things that was occurring during this time was that interference or I wouldn't say interference. I would say the melding between the federal government and state government was happening more and more often. But when cooperative federalism came into play, it was during a time of crisis. It's when the federal government took over specific state agencies, specific corporations in order to help states survive the Great Depression. So such as many welfare programs that we have today were specifically just state programs. The federal government not only took those over, but funded, fully funded those programs in order to help people get through the depression. Also, the federal government created federal corporations for the first time. And this was a prime example is the Tennessee Valley Authority in which all electrical activity or electrical uh, power in the state of Tennessee, uh, Mississippi, Alabama is all done by this authority. This provided jobs and provided electricity to an area that did not have that. Under the local government involvement that uh, that co cooperative federalism had is that it allowed federal programs to do local work. There were many challenges on the constitutionality of a lot of the programs that FDR put in place, and some of them were overturned. And, but a lot of FDR programs exist even till today. And the cooperative federalism has changed quite a bit, but it lasted from the 1930s to the mid 1960s. Now, during cooperative federalism, there were specific ways to give money to states from the federal government. The states needed money for different programs to expand, to grow, to do almost everything. So starting during, uh, during the 1930s, federal government start giving out what is called a category grant. Uh, what that meant was the federal government specifically gave money to states for specific items that the states needed to do. And this was the hallmark of cooperative federalism. But also during this time, something that many people considered insidious kind of grew out of this. Well, over time, especially during the cooperative federalism period, states became more and more dependent upon funds from the federal government. So in order for certain states to fund certain programs that they needed, the federal government would add caveats to these grants. Basically that uh, for one, if you would like to have these grants for this year, please make sure to change your laws to integrate schools or to change your, uh, change your laws to apply uh, different subjects in schools 
make it a requirement. Or if you would like to have this road construction, uh, make sure that you outlaw leaded gasoline or that you protect the environment by following these rules. This all began under category grants and many states complied in order to get the money. Block grants came along later during the Reagan administration during uh, uh, a new form of federalism at that time. Block grants basically gave the states a specific amount of money that they could use, but the states could use it at their own discretion. But there was something called devolution began. At the same time where block grants were given to states, more authority, more responsibility over social programs or other programs that the federal government had created was being transferred to the states. Yet the federal government had overall authority over these different programs, but the states had the responsibility of funding them. This is devolution. Now, during this time, during the different courts, um, understand, when you hear something as the Marshall Court, the Rehnquist Court, or the Roberts Court, each court is named after the tenure of the Chief Justice. Under the Rehnquist Court, we can, when it comes to federalism, uh, I don't necessarily, when I'm talking about federalism, necessarily go over specific court actions. I may go over specific court cases. This book likes to do that. So I'm going to skip this part. Let's see here. And that's the end here. So the end of chapter three. Well, let's go over a few things here in chapter three and uh, that I want to touch base on here. And this is about some of the documents that I want you to look at. I'm gonna share my screen again. All right. Now I gave you the basics of how the constitution uh, went over uh, uh, the different, how federalism works. It gave you all of wonderful highlights, but I want you to look at chapter three supporting documents. Of course, the constitution of the United States is there. I want you to go over it, but I want you to go over McCullen versus Maryland. And I want you to read this decision. This is in your supporting documents. It's very detailed uh, reasons why the Marshall Court decided over McCullen versus Maryland. And this is highly important that you understand the reasoning for this. This will be on your exam and it may be over a surprise quiz. You never know. Also, I want you to understand the United States versus Lopez. This is also a decision that was determined. Let me get this up here. Do, 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 do. That was determined under the Rehnquist Court that dealt with the same issue of sovereignty between the federal government and the state government. United States versus Lopez was about a possession of a firearm near school property. And Congress had passed a law that stated that anybody seen or, or, or suspected of carrying a firearm within a certain distance of school property is in violation of federal law and a felony. Well, in this case, Lopez had a gun, was, uh, was a person who had a gun, was on school grounds, was charged with a felony, 
And eventually the case went to the US Supreme Court where the US Supreme Court struck down the law stating that the Commerce Clause does not regulate or does not apply to areas near schools. So any federal law that banned the use of a firearm or had a firearm near it was considered illegitimate. But, but only state law can actually apply their laws when it came to that firearm. So it was setting a clear demarcation of where federal authorities lie and state authority. So please read this case. It's very important that you do because it will be on your exam as well. Now that should be the end of it. Now remember, if you have any questions about anything that we went over today, uh, remember we meet every Wednesday at 1 p.m. But if you have a question before that, after after watching this lecture, and I know I'm not the best at these video recorded lectures, email me or send an appointment with me and we'll definitely talk and we'll go over this uh, much clearer. But remember to always do your best at whatever thing you do. Think critically and God bless you and I'll see you next time.